Hey guys, it's Kevin from Spirited Systems, and today we're gonna to talk about how to choose the right boot for tactical applications. A boot that works in a dry, rocky, mountainous region is not necessarily the same boot you would need in a humid and swampy flatland. It simply won't apply across the board. It's not as easy to say, buy this specific boot, so instead we're gonna focus on characteristics and features that you need to pay attention to when selecting a boot. We'll cover everything from hot weather to cold weather, but we will stop short of extreme cold and Arctic conditions, as those really have their own special considerations. The most immediate difference when selecting a boot is whether it has a waterproof lining like Gore-Tex or not. For most hot weather situations, you're going to want a non-waterproof boot because the waterproof lining will keep the boot from being as breathable as we need it to be, and it'll prevent the boot from drying out uh, if the boots do become soaked. In a hot, dry climate, we're less concerned about water coming in from the outside and more concerned about sweat being able to escape from the inside. Uh, so ventilation will be important to keep your feet cool, dry, and comfortable. We're not as concerned uh, about drainage, and we're more concerned about protection of the foot from sharp rocks and from sand from entering into the boots. Boots that I avoid in this type of environment are boots with excessive mesh. While mesh may be uh, very light and breathable, in my experience, they allow too much sand to enter into the boot, and then they attract a lot of stickers as well. The other thing about mesh boots is that they're generally not durable enough for the rough terrain often found in deserts. In a tropical environment, we know our feet are gonna get wet regardless of what we do, uh, so the ability for them to drain will be vital. You will not have time to remove your boots after crossing something like a swamp or landing onto a beach. Uh, so you'll need something uh, like the drain ports that you find on your typical jungle style boot uh, to expel that water from the inside. Just know that with drain ports on the side, that stepping in even the smallest puddle, it will allow water to come inside the boot as well. The downside to having non-waterproof boots is that sometimes your feet will get soaked when they otherwise could have been dry if you did have a waterproof boot on. If you ever walked through some wet vegetation shortly after a good rain, you'll know exactly what I mean because your feet often get more wet from that wet vegetation than it does from the actual rain. So you'll have to decide uh, what's the best for your feet and what you can tolerate because you wanna avoid having feet that are constantly wet so you can avoid immersion foot, also known as trench foot. For most cooler weather situations, I'll go for boots that do have a waterproof lining, roughly anything that's under 80 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. In a mountainous environment, it may be slightly warm during the day, but it often cools off pretty dramatically during the night. During the summer, you'll often get torrential downpours during the afternoon, uh, so you'll want a waterproof boot to keep your feet dry in that scenario. You'll also encounter areas where the ground is saturated from previous snowmelt, uh, and the vegetation is often wet from those afternoon thunderstorms. So there are non-lined leather boots on the market um, that have a natural water resistance, and you can help to waterproof them by using a wax product such as Snow Seal or something similar. These boots have the benefit of being more breathable than a Gore-Tex lined boot, but you will need to upkeep the maintenance on them by cleaning them and reapplying the wax from time to time. They are a pretty good option and worth considering, uh, but I still prefer to use a boot with an actual waterproof lining inside of them. A major and often overlooked factor in boot selection is what the midsole is made out of. The midsole is the section of the boot between the outsole and the insole that handles shock absorption. The midsole is needed to keep your foot from getting sore and it provides the structure and stability uh, to the boot. There are generally two types of midsoles to pick from, and that is EVA, which stands for ethylene vinyl acetate, and then there is PU, which stands for polyurethane. It's important to determine what type of midsole you get because they each have different characteristics. The EVA midsole will provide out-of-the-box comfort and usually at a lighter weight, but it will come at the cost of breaking down quicker and be less supportive overall. EVA will feel kind of cloud-like as 
the cushioning is softer, but the softer foam is not as durable as its PU counterpart. If you're only concerned about short duration missions or operate mainly in an urban setting, having an EVA uh, midsole may not be a bad option as they are usually lighter in weight and less expensive. A PU midsole, on the other hand, is denser and will last you a much longer time, but usually comes at the cost of a longer break-in period. When it comes to going off the beaten path, a PU midsole will be more supportive and protective of your foot. And in my opinion, you should be looking at getting a PU midsole if you want a boot that lasts in adverse environments and doesn't need to be replaced with just a few months of hard use. The outsole is the part of the boot that interfaces with the ground. The stiffness of the outsole will affect how you travel over different types of terrain. If you have a very flexible sole, you will not move efficiently up a rocky slope uh, especially if you're going to be side hilling a lot on that slope. Uh, having a stiffer sole will allow you to transfer more weight to the edge of the foot, and that's going to be more efficient when you're moving vertically. One thing you want to note is that you want to match the stiffness of the sole to the stiffness of the upper. If you have a boot with a very stiff sole, but the upper can fold over on itself, you're going to increase the risk of rolling an ankle because as you go to step, the sole is going to be very firm and supportive, and then the upper is going to want to fold over on itself and allow your ankle to go with it. It's okay to have a flexible upper if the outsole of the boot somewhat matches the flexibility of it. A flexible sole can be more comfortable when moving across flat terrain uh, as it does allow your foot to flex with the boot. If you wear an aggressively stiff boot on flat, soft terrain, uh, it will feel clunky and you will start to wear yourself out. I would advise not to go too flexible though. A moderate amount of stiffness is good even in those flat terrain situations. So just be aware of what type of terrain you'll be on and match the stiffness of the sole to that terrain. If your sole is soft, it's going to have more stickiness uh, than a harder sole, which will give you more grip on rock, especially wet rock. The downside to a soft sole is that the tread will start to wear down a bit faster. A harder sole will work better on soft and muddy ground and will generally keep its tread around for longer, but sometimes you'll get chunks breaking off of the sole in sharp, rocky types of terrain. A stitch sole is going to be better for longevity, but will also be more expensive than a glued on sole a stitch sole is going to be better if you have to deal with extreme heat or if you have to walk through some type of scorched earth scenario and you step into an ash pit. With a glued on sole, uh, you run the risk that the glue becomes too hot and melts and then the outsole of your boot comes sliding off. That being said, most of the boots that I do have are glued on soles and it really depends on the manufacturer uh, and their quality control if the sole remains intact through regular use. One of the biggest things I've come to look at is how the eyelets are constructed. The main types of eyelets are going to be punched, and then you have these metal loops that are riveted in. Then you also have boots where the leather is folded in on itself and sewn to create a loop. You also have D-rings, and then you have webbing eyelets, and then you also have these riveted on metal hooks. So I've come to really avoid the webbing style of eyelets. Uh, I just don't find them durable enough for extended use. Then I start to have trust issues with them, and that's not what you want with your footwear. The webbing starts to get worn down by the friction of the laces, and then it comes at the risk of the webbing tearing apart. The D-ring style have a risk of shearing off, but I also find them kind of annoying because if the lace falls out of the D-ring, you have to lace these up every time that you want to put your boot on. So my preference is to have punched eyelets at the bottom of the boot and then the metal hooks at the top. So this allows me to put the boot on pretty fast and lace them up and take them off quickly as well. I do not like proprietary style lacing or quick lacing systems. While they are very convenient and fast, I want my laces to be field repairable with something like paracord. And oftentimes with these quick lacing systems, you are not able to do that. 
my ideal height for a boot is eight inches. I find that the best compromise for mobility and support. If you have a boot that's taller than that, you may not have enough movement in your ankle to walk long distances comfortably. Shorter boots like six inches are nice and light, uh, but they often lack the stability and support that you need in more adverse terrain. And then they have more chance of getting debris inside of them. Trail running shoes, van skate shoes, and the new trend of barefoot style shoes are going to be terrible choices for any kind of adverse terrain. You'll hear people talk about how great their trail running shoes were on the Pacific Crest Trail or the Appalachian Trail, and that's the point, is that they are on a trail which is basically a groomed surface. Once you leave that type of surface, you'll have to endure what the earth is actually shaped like, and it's often overgrown and uneven. Now, for the fit of the boot, every manufacturer is gonna have a little bit of a different fit. I've had it where I wear a size 13 in one boot model, and then I'm more of a 12 and a half in another model from the same manufacturer. So it is going to be important to try on the boot before making a commitment. I like to do a soft break-in where I wear the boots around the house during that return window to make sure they're going to work for me or not. You do not want to buy a $300 or $400 pair of boots off the internet and then immediately put them on your feet and then head out the door to find out those are not going to work for you. So try to get as much time in them as you can before you actually commit to them. The materials the upper is made out of is going to have a big impact on how durable the boot is, how breathable the boot is, and how water resistant the boot is. A leather boot that is treated with wax can be water resistant enough to not need a waterproof lining, although many leather boots do come with one of those Gore-Tex linings as well. So leather is a classic material used in the construction of boots. It is durable and breathable, but a leather boot is going to need a little bit more care than a synthetic boot. A synthetic boot it can be durable, but the quality will vary from manufacturer to manufacturer in exactly what type of materials they are using. Synthetic boots tend to be lighter than leather boots, but the real downside to a mainly synthetic boot is that they're not as protected when exposed to extreme heat. So boots will come with a various amount of padding, and this can be beneficial for cushioning and protection against sharp objects poking into your ankles. Padding will usually make a boot warmer than a boot with little to no padding, so you will have to decide if you value extra cushioning or enhanced breathability. In a tropical environment, you're going to want a boot with little to no padding, so the material dries fast and maintains breathability. Many boots will come with a rand like this or some sort of toe box made of rubber or polyurethane. The toe box on a lot of boots are the weak spot as they are simply just glued on and then one misstep among the rocks uh, and then they start to peel off. I prefer my boots to have a full wraparound rand unless I'm in a tropical environment and I really need something with drain ports. In colder environments, you're gonna to have to make a decision on if you need an insulated boot or a non-insulated boot. More often than not, you're going to want a non-insulated boot, even when it's pretty cold. Uh, a lot of people get kind of freaked out when they hear it's going to be 30 degrees outside and they think their feet are going to freeze off, so they start to overdo it on the insulation. And then, once they go on a longer movement, uh, their feet become uncomfortably warm. An insulated boot can be nice if you're mostly static or faced with extreme cold, but it can actually make your foot sweat too much and become cold because now your feet are wet. A lot of people mistakenly think that they've lost the waterproofness of their boots when they're walking through snow, uh, when in reality is that their feet are actually just wet because they are sweating. So you need to avoid having your feet sweat as much as possible because that's when you get into trouble is when the sweat starts to freeze. So I like to have a boot that is a half size to full size larger, and I wear a thicker sock uh, when I'm faced with a little bit colder temperatures. If your boots are too tight, your feet will get cold easier because of the constriction of blood flow. So don't try to jam a thicker sock into your normal size boot. It's a difficult task to manage to predict just how cold it will get, and it will take a little trial and error to determine 
what you can get away with in certain weather conditions. So try to get out there as much as you can in the cold and see what your boots are doing uh, in those specific types of environments. I know that it seems like quite a bit of information, but it's really just scratching the surface and all the things that go into selecting a pair of boots. If you want more information beyond boots and how they tie into the fighting load, check out our Patrol Basics series here. And then if you want more information on how to operate in colder weather, check out our cold weather layering series here. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Remember to subscribe to our channel. And then if you found this video useful, please give it a like. We'll see you on the next one.